Sounds good. This meeting is being recorded. Oh. Well, that was a lovely reminder. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Michelle Rakowski, and today I will be presenting the second installment of Many Hands, the people who made the, w, um, the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the American Quilt Study Group, Kohler Foundation, and Wisconsin Arts Board with support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Today's presentation will focus on the Wisconsin Quilt History Project, as that's really where the museum began. Just to introduce myself, I've been working as an intern for the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts this past year, recording oral histories. I'm a graduate student at UW-Madison, or Milwaukee, sorry about that, working towards my master's in library science and museum studies. This project really began last year as a celebration of the museum's 10th anniversary. I had the honor of collecting oral histories from some of the people who were instrumental to its founding and ongoing success. I'd like to note before we go on that oral histories are all about the memories of the participants. So if any point in the video clips, something doesn't mesh with your own knowledge of events, um, that's all right because oral histories are really very personal. It all comes down to their own memories. I had um, the ability to talk to some of the past board, me board members, volunteers, um, and even founding mothers. So, as I mentioned before, today's focus will be on the Wisconsin Quilt History Project, which officially started in 1988. This project was focused on documenting the history of quilts in the state and is what led to the museum that we know and love today. Whenever um, people got talking about the Quilt History Project, these are just some of the names, but not all, that came up. Kay Walters, Luella Doss, Marion Wolf, and Sharon Timpey were all um, women that people thought of when I asked about kind of the beginnings of the project. The North Shore Quilters Guild was also mentioned frequently as many of the early uh, members and founding mothers belonged to that guild, guild even though um, quilting guilds across the state uh, were in support of the project and were very excited about the work that it was doing. Here we'll be seeing a clip of Anne King, whose mother Marion Wolf is a founding mother sharing names of some of the early members that she remembers. Yeah, with the documentation project. Uh, Sharon Tempe and Kay Walters. And I'm going to get to see Kay when I'm there. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> and um, Luella Doss was part of that group. Uh, Warnicky, Ann Hill, she has um, passed away. And as Anne mentioned, some of the uh, earliest members and founding mothers have passed away. Uh, Anne's mother, Marion and Sharon are both um, two notable names that have uh, passed away. So we weren't able to collect their stories, but we tried to get people talking about them so as to represent their memory of, and their contributions to the museum and to the project. So um, the Wisconsin Quilt History Project revolved around documenting quilts and the stories about them from around the state. And the following clips that we're gonna be seeing are from some of the women that I interviewed and their memories of documentations and documentation days. This photo is from a recent documentation that was held at the museum. Um, the basic process is really still the same as it was in the beginning, although of course, the amount of information collected has grown, and that's based on what I heard through the process of collecting these stories. And I'm sure many of you will recognize um, 
the lovely finished basement area at the museum where they were documenting this particular quilt. This clip is from Luella on what I understand to be the first documentation day. Kay Walters also mentioned this documentation, remembering uh, they were there but mostly because of Luella's love of folk art, and that's how they ended up at this particular show. The Wisconsin Quilt History Project started with uh, this show called Spirit America. You see that? And yep. um, I spent uh, 10000 in advertising in order to get the word out all over the state through this show. And so, uh, let's see if you can see. Can you see that? Um, mm -hmm. Hall? Yeah, it's a pilot program, Wisconsin Quilt Project, documenting Wisconsin quilts made from 1800 to 1900. It was actually 1950. Uh, statewide research, free admission, open to persons bringing Wisconsin quilts dated uh, 1800 to 1900. They will be historically documented and photographed for possible historical publication and future exhibitions. Contact Luella Doss at 414-377-9116. So that was the first quilt day ever. Okay. And it was at a show called Spirit America, uh, which was held down in uh, Milwaukee. All right. And as Luella mentioned, many of um, the members in the early days had to invest a lot of their own um, time and resources to get the project off the ground so people would know what they were working on uh, and bring their quilts out to be documented. Here we have another clip um, of Anne's recollections, this time focusing on her mother's work with the documentations. They were, my understanding is that the group was uh, following like some of what other states had done. And for Wisconsin, they were picking quilts that were prior to 1950. And um, they started with uh, like a template of paperwork, of what questions they wanted to ask and what items they wanted documented. and that. That kind of morphed over time to being more inclusive and um, eventually that information was going to be saved to, I think Michigan is the one who started uh, the computer version of keeping all the documentation records, like for whoever was, whatever states were doing this. Um, so they were, were they, they changed that documentation um, template over time to include more things and it got very sophisticated and I remember the dining room table <laughs> being full of information and uh, eventually like uh, once the documentation was done and we're talking 7,000 quilts um, they went through that to figure out which ones were going to go in a book so there was, yes, paperwork everywhere. <laughs> but, um, the, the one time that I went up there, up uh, northern Wisconsin with my mom, I got a, a good taste of what she was doing in the different counties. And, and as Anne mentioned here, um, this was not a project that expected everyone to travel um, to Cedarburg or um, to any particular place in Wisconsin, these women would host these across the state of Wisconsin, getting hosted at other guilds uh, and going around to all the different counties to run these documentation days so that everyone would be able to participate. And this is a clip from my interview with uh, Elred Johnson. And here she is sharing 
how her personal passion for identifying different quilting patterns made documentation days even more enjoyable for her. Like I said, you know, I always, always have to have supported. And I've always, I've always been interested in um, identifying quilts. So, you know, we would come to the documentation days and I've always had my own copy of Barbara Brackman. <laughs> so I could, could help to identify quilt blocks and things like that. Because as we know, the stories behind these quilts are massively important, but understanding the patterns, understanding the artistry that went into them is naturally something that the documentation is also focused on and continue to. So here is a clip from Luella uh, discussing the reason why they chose 1950 as the cutoff date on these early documentations instead of 1900 as they had originally planned. But even though I never saw my mom make a quilt or my grandmother, my grandmother gave me quilts that her mom had made. So there was a gap there where people could buy blankets. And, and uh, after about 1950, people stopped making quilts, except in very small pockets. So that early date that I had from 1800 to 1900 was changed to about 1850 to 1950. And the reason we cut off that at, at 1950 was that in the fabric industry, there were uh, a change in how the dyes were made and how they saturated the cloth. And so the quilts look different after 1950. And there was also a proliferation of mixed blends, even among the population. So we, that's the reason, and there are, there are not a lot of people who started, who helped start the Quilt History Project, mm -hmm. who know all these things, because there is really, you know, We just did it and got it done. Uh, and uh, one of the other things that Luella would mention later on in this same interview is that there's the fear, of course, of losing the older quilts. You know, it's still important, she emphasized that it's still important to collect new quilts and recognize the artistry and new styles and new stories, but the real fear is that the quilts would be passed on to later generations that might of a family that might not appreciate the work that went into the quilt or they might move out of state and so they'd be disconnected from Wisconsin and from their roots. Mayor Beth does a lot of work with the documentations even today and here she is sharing more about the process of documenting a quilt. I heard about the, you know, like the founding mothers and um, I think they went, I think it's 49 counties in Wisconsin and went and did publicity that they were doing uh, documentations of quilts and encouraged people to come and bring their items. And, and uh, photograph them and sew the label on the back. Uh, part of it was a fundraiser. Uh, and the other part was just collecting all the stories. Uh, and, and importantly, Mary Beth uh, mentions that it was a also a fundraising effort. Uh, at the time, this was to fund ongoing documentations, but then eventually it would um, be the funding for writing the book and eventually, of course, the museum, although I'm getting ahead of myself with that. <laughs> um, and then here you can see one of the documentation tags uh, that are still used to uh, and sewn on to the quilts, as Mary Beth mentioned. <laughs> 
And then so much work went in and goes in to documenting the artistry and the history of these quilts. But the question remained, what are we going to do with all of these stories? What are we going to do with all of the information that's been collected? The original plan was not to form a museum, but to give this information to an existing institution that would have the capacity to save this information. In our interview, Kay Walters talked about how they offered the documentation materials to the Helen Louise Allen textile collection at UW-Madison for safekeeping. Uh, but they didn't have the resources to devote to such a large collection. They had talked about it earlier. They had talked about accepting this information kind of early on when the Quilt History Project hadn't quite uh, gone as far <laughs> as collecting thousands upon thousands of stories. Um, and then at this point, after they had collected so much information, I don't think they were prepared. They didn't realize how ambitious these women were. So they would develop a slide program, as you'll see here uh, in, from this clip of an interview I had with Kay Walters. Uh, the audio is of fairly poor quality. So I took the liberty of transcribing what Kay had to say so that you can all read along, but I will still play her, her words. Hopefully you can hear. This was another one of the fundraising efforts. Um, and it was, Kay mentioned that it, you know, you could send out the slides on their own or have someone like her come and help interpret them and give them as the program to the guilds, um, which again, as I mentioned earlier, guilds across the state were very invested in what was going on here and very supportive of these endeavors. And then of course, uh, what else can you do with these stories? Write a book. <clears throat> they decided to write a book containing a selection of quilts from these documentations. And the book was published in 2001 and the second edition would come out in 2008. Uh, this is the cover of the first edition. Um, recently we had the, uh, these, some of these quilts on exhibit at the museum. So you will probably recognize this particular quilt on the cover. This is a clip of Judy Zolzer Levine discussing the thought process behind creating the book, the why behind this new endeavor for them. We had was an astounding number. I mean, it was in the thousands and other uh, states were publishing their books and they had they had documented 300 quilts and you're like wait a minute <laughs> we've got way more than that uh, so we contacted Ellen Court to help us to glean through all of the, the information that we have and to turn it into the first book so then we had the first book under our belts And we will have another clip of Judy sharing more about the research that went in to collecting the stories here in the book. And when doing the book was interesting, um, 
there was a committee, and I don't remember how many people were on the committee, but we had a book committee, committee who sat down. First off, they went through all of the documents and found stories. And that was about 300, 400 different entries. And then they went through, pulled the slides, and then we had they had meetings where they would listen to the story and look at the slide and decide if that was of any interest that could be developed into a further story for the book. So that took quite a long process. But yeah, they, they did that one manually. Pulled all the records, every single piece of paper they looked at. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a big yeah, I mean, and we think about it now with databases, how easy it is. You just type in the, your search field, what you're looking for, and and then, you know, connect it. Uh, yeah, that was not available to us at that point. So the process for writing the book was quite arduous, but I think they did an incredible job pulling together the books that they did and the stories that go with them. And as Judy mentioned, uh, the slides that Sharon Timpey was instrumental in creating were part of this process for researching the book. And Kay Walters also discussed the research committee that was formed in order to handle the selection process and how this work took years to complete. Um, it was in because, as Judy said, it was all manually done. There was no shortcuts in this endeavor. And of course, there were so many brilliant stories to be shared. And although the book and the slide program are both were and are great endeavors, um, as we know, these ladies were incredibly ambitious and were not done yet. They would be purchasing the barn in the early 2000s as well and which would become the museum we know and love today, a far cry from the original property. But again, I get ahead of myself because we will be covering that transition period from when uh, they were focusing on the documentations alone into dreams of the museum and the eventual building, rebuilding of the barn. So I hope you have enjoyed today's presentation um, and that you will be joining us for the next two installations of this series. Uh, February 18th is the next one covering that transition period I mentioned. And then March 18th is going to be the final uh, installation covering the women of the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. This will be um, discussing more of the women that I had the pleasure of getting to know and getting to talk to in my interviews through the course of this project. Thank you all again for joining and thank you so much um, to all of the women listed here who I had the pleasure of speaking to. Um, do we have any questions at all that I can attempt to answer? <laughs> Nothing from Facebook, but uh, one quick question. Um, with all of the interviews that you've done and kind of that, that early, what are your overall impressions? Oh, that's a good one. Overall impressions, I guess, of the project and of the museum, the thread that stood out to me the most was the emphasis on the community, the emphasis on the people who were involved. Um, that's why I, I titled this series the way it is, you know, the, the people who, who made this museum is really kind of the focus because everyone emphasized the great community that they found, the friendships that they made, um, because it's one of those things where even, I mean, the project itself, the documentations itself, the book, the building of the museum, the running of the museum, all of those things are incredibly difficult, time-consuming tasks, but it it's not the way that it's remembered. You know, there, there are struggles and people remember 
you know, the hard times, but that is never the emphasis in any of the stories that I heard. It's always about, you know, the friendships and how much fun really everyone had in getting to be together. Because I think at the end of the day, this, this museum is a community. It's, and it's a home for a lot of people. And for some of the women that I talked with, it's a family. Um, for some people whose, you know, children have maybe moved away or spouses have passed. So I think really that's, that's at the crux. That's my main impression that I've taken away from doing this project. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I hope everybody joins us um, on February 18th. We hope to see you then.